before we go back on the record, so this is not for the transcript or the record, I just draw to your attention that we have a big viewership out there, but they're all Mr. Cantor's students. <laughs> if you're all content, um, well, I should just say, the Tribunal Secretary will be able to provide you with all the statistics if you happen to be interested. That's not got nothing to do with the substance of our, of our proceedings. But uh, I think we can go back on the record now. Um, um, Mr. Alexandra, back to you. Um, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I don't have a um, script. If I had, I wouldn't know where I was uh, in the script. Um, but um, given the questions from the tribunal, I don't think we will manage in the remaining half an hour, 35 minutes, so we ask for your indulgence for a few minutes more. No, you, you certainly have latitude. We've been the ones who've been delaying you, so you've got the latitude. Uh, on issues of delay, uh, we have a somewhat different view. <laughs> um, these, are, these are not lingering effects. <laughs> um, Mr. President and members of the tribunal, I want to go back just for a minute to slide um, 21, um, where we gave you quotes from claimants' memorial on the merits just to show the case they set forth in their memorial on the merits and how this case shifted and continued shifting through their rejoinder on jurisdiction, their opening, and now their closing. I want to focus on the last quote, the last bullet point, um, and towards the end of the um, quote, um, where the last sentence where claimants allege in their memorial on the merits that, and I quote, consistent with customer international law practice, it is at that point that the state takes possession of the land, therefore satisfying the customer requirements of a direct taking. And that point is the point of dispossession, the taking of possession. So if you look at the chart that I keep referring you to, um, you will see in the seventh column the dispossession date. Um, and you go down because the dispossession date is relevant only to the third uh, on the chart, the second, but in terms of categories of properties, the third category, which is in the judicial phase. And you see that the dates of dispossession may vary somewhat, but they are all in 2008. So the customary requirement of a direct taking in on claimant's own case is uh, happened sometime in 2008. Obviously, with respect to the other properties, it hasn't happened yet. Um, what is interesting is that we heard in the opening and then in the closing of claimants, um, and this is an echo of their, if I can say, amended case in the rejoinder on jurisdiction, which obviously is not the appropriate place and time to amend one's claims on the merits. Um, but they're now saying that it's the transfer of title um, that is the act that constitutes an expropriation. And they're saying that for obvious reasons, that avoids their jurisdictional problems. Um, what we say is several things. One. These are claims that are not timely. They have not been developed. Um, they should not have been raised in the rejoinder on jurisdiction to begin with. Um, if they were to raise those claims and substantiate them, we're talking about three properties. And so with respect to all the other properties, then according to their own argument, expropriation has not yet taken place. Again, it's a significant shift from what has been argued. Um, so far, but I think what is most important here to emphasize is this has not been their claim until the rejoinder on jurisdiction. Um, another claim that was um, very briefly referred to in the rejoinder on the merits and voiced in the opening and somewhat in the closing was a denial of justice claim. Again, a new claim raised in the um, rejoinder on jurisdiction, entirely unsubstantiated. We all know the high standard for denial of justice and they have to just 
asserting that Costa Rican courts ha take a long time is no substantiation of a denial of justice claim. And we've pleaded that, and I'll leave it, uh, leave it at that. They have to show much more. Why the delay? Who caused the delay? What are the steps that are taken? And our argument would be if they were to argue that point that um, Costa Rican law allows them a number of opportunities to challenge the decisions. And we have explained that in our um, written submissions, the expert reports and valuation, how they can challenge those expert reports and what happens next and so on and so forth. And they have to show the, the high standard of denial of justice with respect to those steps. And I refer you to our written submissions in the interest of time because <coughs> I don't have anything new to add um, to that point. Um, I will say, though, since we are transitioning to the merits, that um, what, what is happening here in this case is Costa Rica is taking steps to protect the environment and protect an endangered species. Uh, we thought that would not be controversial, but we read in claimants' witness statements in particular, um, statements to the effect that what um, Costa Rica <coughs> is doing has nothing to do with the turtles. Um, we heard arguments by counsel, including today in the closing, that it's not necessarily the urban development that's a problem. There are problems with poaching and so on and so forth. Um, we don't, Costa Rica doesn't deny there are many issues that have to be addressed. What Costa Rica insists is that urban development is a huge problem. And claimant's own witness, who is also an expert in the matter, testified before you. And he stated he made some very helpful statements, um, which I want to go quickly through with you to then make the case that I want to make. Um, with respect to urban, urban development, he stated the following question, and I quote, what you're saying is urban development may be harmful to the nesting of the turtles, and in fact, in most cases, unless it is carefully and strictly controlled, it is. Is that generalization more or less correct? Answer, it's very close to being correct, yes. The transcript reference is there. Um, he also said, in response to a question, and the question was, quote, as I understand from your testimony, you do agree that expropriating private property within the 75 meters is a measure that does protect the turtles. Answer, that is correct. You have the transfer reference. You don't have on the slide, but I will quote another statement by Dr. Rusenko. Question, so in a way, it, the expropriation of the 75 meter strip, is a stronger measure than controlling development. It may be unnecessarily stronger, but it is stronger. Answer, it is stronger. But you will need to control development beyond that 125 meters. This is transcript, page 472, line 19, to page 473, line 1. So Dr. Rusenko is saying urban development is a very serious problem. He's saying expropriation may not be necessary, but it is certainly help. It may be stronger than necessary, but it does protect the turtles. And He's going beyond that and saying you, you, you need to control development even beyond that 125-meter um, zone. He's also saying, and you have that quote on the slide, um, the third quote that you have on the slide, quote, a question, do you have any reason to doubt, Dr. Rusenko, that the government of Costa Rica was willing and interested in making a genuine effort to protect the turtles? Answer, no, I don't. And you have the transcript reference on the slide. So what transpires from this discussion is claimant's own witness with expertise in the matter, who, by the way, also expressed in his witness statement and confirmed on the stand his appreciation and respect 
for the head of the national park, uh, Mr. Piedra, and for the efforts that the park rangers uh, make to protect the area. He is saying urban development is a problem. Costa, Costa Rica, there is no doubt Costa Rica is driven by a genuine desire to protect the turtles. The measures are justified. Costa Rica is expropriating private property that may be unnecessary because strictly controlled development, he says, a code with teeth um, is sufficient or may be sufficient, but they are going beyond that. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, what transpires from Dr. Rusenko's testimony and from the testimony of Mr. Berkowitz is that the Costa Rican government, through MINAE, through members of Congress, engaged in a public debate, in a public discussion, transparent, um, with the obvious desire to collect the views of all constituents and understand how better to protect the turtles. You, you know from Mr. Berkowitz's testimony that he had an opportunity to meet with the minister himself and express his views and have a discussion with the minister of what is the best way to protect the turtles. You have seen from the documents that, Mr. Uh, that Minister Carlos Manuel Rodriguez had a view, they had meetings, and they were discussing whether need, there is a need to extend the park, as Dr. Rusenko himself, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, testified might be necessary beyond the 125 meters. This was all a transparent debate. The minutes of those meetings were provided to Mr. Berkowitz. Um, Dr. Rusenko engaged in a discussion uh, with the minister. He answered questions. He met with the minister. Um, the Costa Rican government sought input by the affected constituents, by experts in the area. We don't know the full extent of that effort. It's not in the record, but what we have in the record is sufficient. Congress dealt with bills that discussed potentially a different regime. At the end of the day, a democratic government engaged in a democratic process of collecting views, of processing those views, of uh, discussing them openly and transparently, came to a conclusion. That conclusion was the park is there. It's 50 meters public zone plus 75 meters buffer zone. The property in the 75 meters should be expropriated. And that's what the government is trying to do. Um, there is no question of lack of goodwill. There is no question that this is in the public interest. Um, the question is, and there are several questions that arise, and again, I will refer you to our written submissions. Um, one question is, is this an expropriation, not under Costa Rican law, but within the terms of Article 10.7? And our argument there is that we don't have jurisdiction. But if you did, you would also have um, to have a look at Annex um, 10, yeah. 10C to see if, in particular, with respect to the regulatory measures at issue here, whether they fall within the scope of that annex, because there is no question that those are measures of general application for the purposes of environmental protection. And I refer you to our written submissions. If you ever get to that point, you will have to make that determination. And we submit to you, as we did in our written uh, briefs, that claimants have not made the case that those regulatory measures that they have uh, put at issue in this case um, uh, do not fall within the scope of Annex 10C. I also want to draw your attention, perhaps in response to um, the tribunal's admonition that we might wish to address an argument um, or statement made by El Salvador in these proceedings in relation to Chapter 17. Um, and we, we draw your attention, and again, we are a little bit constrained in terms of time, but I want to be brief and point you to Article 17.2, which is on slide 25 and on your screen, um, which requires that a party, it says a party shall not fail to effectively enforce its environmental laws in um, paragraph 1A. And then, if you look at the end of paragraph 1, subparagraph D, a party, I will read the whole sentence, accordingly, the parties understand that a party is in compliance with subparagraph A, where a course of action or inaction 
reflects a reasonable exercise of such discretion or results from a bona fide decision regarding the allocation of resources. And the discretion is with respect to enforcement of environmental matters that have, may have different priorities. So Article 17.2 allows Costa Rica a measure of discretion in implementing in environmental laws, including a measure of discretion in terms of how to carry out the expropriation, taking into account allocation of resources. And unless that discretion is unreasonable, Costa Rica is in full compliance with that. Um, I'm raising that point because there has been a discussion about um, arbitrary choices made by Costa Rica in terms of what to expropriate and what to not, not to expropriate. This allegation has not been proven at all. Um, and there has been an allegation that Costa Rica does not proceed quickly with expropriations because of lack of funds. And um, we submit to you that even if that were the case, um, and there is no evidence that it is the case. The evidence is that they are looking to improve the, the um, expropriation procedures. But even if that were the case, there is a certain level of discretion that Costa Rica is, uh, is provided under uh, CAFTA. Um, and then finally, you have paragraph two, which states that the parties recognize that it is inappropriate to encourage trade, or in this case, investment, by weakening or reducing the protections afforded in domestic environmental law. And so each party shall strive to ensure that it does not waive or, what or otherwise derogate from such laws in a manner that reduces the protections afforded in those laws as an encouragement for trade with another party or as an encouragement for the establishment, acquisition, expansion, or retention of an investment. And so Costa Rica cannot weaken its environmental laws adopted well before claimants made their investments to encourage them to expand or retain their investments. Um, Mr. President and members of the um, tribunal, I will now um, pass the floor to Ms. Howard McCandles to discuss issues of damages, and after that I will make some very brief concluding remarks. Before I do that, though, I do want to address um, a couple of other points in, um, that are in relation to this um, calculation. It's not just calculation, what we refer to as a new methodology, a new calculation of damages that um, claimants submitted with their at the very end of their uh, closing argument. And you have already decided to admit this into the record, and I'm not going to challenge that decision. Um, I do want to say, though, that um, a couple of points. First, if you can pull this out and look at it, because I want to refer to it very quickly. Um, we have been provided with references for the first group or category, um, which is the A, B, C, and V lots. Um, the references to the B and SPG lots, as we understand them, are to Um And I want to point out a couple of things. First, the column property cost. We understand, and we may be wrong because we didn't have time to study this, but we understand that refers to the purchase price. And if that is the case, um, the point that I want to make is that throughout this proceeding, we have asked that they provide the contracts that would evidence the purchase price, and they have not done that. Um, you recall the discussion of the document that you in the end decided um, you did not um, want to allow into the record when we uh, applied, um, when we submitted to the tribunal an application to um, enter it into the record for the purposes of the purchase price. Um, the objection was essentially, well, the objection was one, 
surprise and ambush, even though that document had been in their possession since 2003, and Mr. Berkowitz had quite a vivid recollection of what this document said. The other objection was inconvenience. They were not close to their files. Um, the substantive objection was those prices are not relevant. At the very end of their closing arguments, they have made them relevant for this purpose. And we still don't have any of the contracts for the purchases of their property. And the reliance here is on extraneous, I wouldn't even call it evidence, but extraneous information. You will also recall um, that Mr. Kazmarek was cross-examined yesterday on the purchase price of the Delos property. Um, Mr. Kazmarek relied, on claim, relied for that on claimant's own expert. And claimant's expert's um, statements as to what the value of those properties were, the billows. Um, and Mr. Kazmarek was challenged and was asked whether it was not more reasonable um, to adopt a different view. Different view from what their own expert was advocating. And we don't believe it is quite appropriate to ask our expert to speculate based on uh, indirect, to put it mildly, information about what the purchase price may be when the purchase contracts are in the possession of claimants and they've refused to provide that. Um, and Mr. Kazmarek was asked a question in relation to exhibit C24B, um, which shows the recorded price as half a million colonies, which is $1,200. Well, but um, Mr. Berkowitz has taken a mortgage of, um, what is it, $370,000. And how can this price be? It was $450,000, wasn't it? $370,000 well, plus $80,000. There, um, there is one. I may be using a different exhibit, but we have the same situation, so if you allow me to use exhibit C24B to save um, time. And at the very end, I, and I realize you don't have it, so uh, I'm told you have it in the pocket of the binder. So if you, if you um, would like to take it and look at it, and I'm looking at the very last page in the Spanish, um, you can look at the Whichever page that is in English. Do you have the page in English? Yeah. If you look at the very end of the document in English, which is the second to last page carrying over to the last page, um, in Spanish it talks about 370,000, which is why I use this language. Um, in favor of and the company in favor of which this amount is, and I'll say what this amount is, is Mr. Berkowitz's company. This amount in Spanish is described as cedula hipotecaria, which in English is a mortgage bond. So what's happening here is Mr. Berkowitz is issuing a bond to his company against which he may borrow if somebody is willing to lend him that amount of money against his property. This is not a mortgage. Um, and we say it is unfair to bring this document to Mr. Kazmarek without explaining to him that this is not really a mortgage and how this operates and asking him to say whether um, this changes his view on what the proper purchase price is. Given that, claimants have in their possession, the purchase contracts, which would state the purchase price of the property. And if they wanted to make a different submission on the base of this document and the document they actually referred to yesterday, they should have developed that evidence through Mr. Berkowitz. And in the absence of that, um, this document is in the record and it speaks for itself and I'm just bringing to your attention what it actually says. Um, Mr. President, with that, if you allow me to pass to Ms. Howard McCandless to talk about damages. 
please do just before we do let me just uh, inquire of my colleagues whether they've got any questions to put to you on the basis of your submission with apologies to Ms. Hayworth and the panelists I do have a question or two for you Mr. Alexandro I inquired of claimant's counsel this morning regarding which legally significant events they would point me to that would have occurred from and after June 2010. From that colloquy and without seeking to characterize whether these events are or are not legally significant and if so for what purpose, I came away with three types of conduct that had been mentioned. The first was maintaining a suspension of the administrative proceedings. The second was investigation of possible annulment of title. And the third was conduct in judicial proceedings. I would like to hear from you on those three points. Thank you, Mr. Cantor. Um, if you allow me to start backwards. The conduct of the judicial proceeding. Um, as I said, to the extent that there is a dispute about the amount of compensation, this dispute arose in 2008 when compensation was clearly offered to them and placed at their disposal and they could have taken. They chose not to. Um, they <coughs> proceeded and submitted the, uh, they disagreed. They objected to the um, administrative appraisal and under cost and recall law, the dispute went to the judiciary. Under the Mondev standard, Costa Rica, if Article 10.7 applied, Costa Rica would be in compliance with that article because compensation was offered. They say it was not adequate. That dispute arose in 2008, and I've made the arguments on, on jurisdiction. The, the fact that this dispute is before the judiciary as a result of their submission, as a result of their objection, to the uh, administrative appraisal cannot make the expropriation or the payment of compensation a continuous act. It is an act that is now being reviewed by Costa Rica's judiciary. This does not make it a continuous conduct or a composite act. And so for them to say the Costa Rican judiciary takes a long time, that would not be a claim under Article 10.7, including 10.7.2. That would be a claim of denial of justice that they have not developed. Uh, just to be clear, I think, although I may be putting words in claimant's counsel's mouth here, that they were seeking to comment on the approach of the government towards the litigation process, not on the conduct of the courts themselves. Well, I... Um, apologize that's not the way I understood it but if that is the allegation we have not seen any evidence that the government is doing anything other than what the Procuraduria normally would do and what the Attorney General's office of any government would normally do in an adversarial proceeding we have seen no evidence of any impropriety of uh, the conduct of the government in the judicial proceeding your the second, uh, I apologize, it was not your. You were simply conveying that to me. The second um, answer that you received related to the so-called annulment of title, and I think I already addressed that. There has been no annulment of title. What we have is a recommendation to conduct, conduct a study. The study is being conducted. It may or may not identify defects. If it did, 
um, there would be an assessment of what those defects are and whose responsibility those defects are. And if it turns out that it's the owner's responsibility, then the Procuraduria will make a judgment call of whether to seek judicial proceedings, because title can only be announced for judicial proceedings, um, whether to seek a judicial proceeding that may result in announcement of title. The bottom line is this is not a measure. This is simply a study at this point. Um, the suspension of the administrative proceeding. Our point on this is, um, first, in relation to the statute of limitations, continuous or composite or one-time act doesn't matter. What matters is when they first acquired knowledge. And our argument, as you know on the fact, is regardless of whether this is a one-time or continuous or composite act, they first acquired knowledge in 2008, and therefore, for the purposes of, statute, of the statute of limitations, that's sufficient. Um, for the purposes of the entry into force of the treaty, where the general standard is a conduct um, would be covered to the extent that it extends after the date of the entry into force of the treaty or the application of the treaty um, to that conduct, we submit what matters here is the suspension order. This is the measure. The court orders a suspension. The administrative agencies comply with and implement the decision of the court. Um, the, this cannot be a one-time act. Uh, the court, this cannot be a continuous act, I'm sorry. If it's a one-time act, the court makes that order, and then it's just a matter of compliance with that order. Uh, that compliance with the order we call the effects of the order, but there is no question that the measure is the order. Thank you. Second question. In addition to the expropriation claims, before the tribunal. There are also claims that the conduct of Costa Rica was contrary to the minimum standard of treatment, including fair and equitable treatment. Leaving to one side the portion of that claim that relates to legitimate expectations, there is a portion of that claim that asserts the conduct of the Costa Rican government is arbitrary. And my impression is that both parties have common ground that the definition of arbitrary starts with the judgment in the LC um, ruling of the International Court of Justice, that uh, not so much something opposed to a rule of law as something opposed to the rule of law, willful disregard of the process of law, an act that shocks or at least surprises a sense of juridical propriety. I understand the parties disagree whether or not the conduct of the government is properly characterized as arbitrary or not. But what is your view about when, in these circumstances, it would become obvious to claimants that the delay is conduct that could be characterized or not characterized as arbitrary? In other words, I don't want you to Tell me whether you think it's arbitrary or not. I know your answer to that question. I want you to focus on the timing issue. Well, it is for uh, claimants to explain when, if it's a matter of, I, I have um, argued to you, members of the tribunal, that in the context of Article 10.7, the administrative appraisals were issued in 2008. That's when a dispute about the amount arose. Um, and so there is really no issue of delay here beyond that. Um, to the extent that we're talking about a delay any further, they have alleged the length of the judicial proceedings, for example. Um, it is not a delay in the sense of promptness of the compensation because the compensation has already been offered. It's, it, if it is a delay, it would be a delay in resolving the dispute about the amount, that is the adequacy of the compensation. Um, arbitrariness is a very high standard in our view, and I'm not going to go into why we agree or disagree. It is up to them to say when they concluded that there was arbitrary conduct, but again, from the perspective of the statute of limitations, um, and with respect to the suspension of the expropriation proceedings, um, they knew or should have known about that 
um, that there was a suspension, if that is a claim of arbitrariness, um, sometime no later than six months after they object to the administrative appraisal. But as a general matter, um, because we don't understand the claim of arbitrariness, um, we don't believe that it ever actually crystallized as an arbitrary conduct, and we think unless they specify when they believe the arbitrary conduct crystallized, we cannot take a position and uh, articulate their claim for that. Claimants have asserted that it is the indefinite duration of the suspension that is conduct that's legally significant. When, in your judgment, would it have become obvious to claimants regarding the duration of the suspension? Um, well, first of all, it is incorrect factually that the suspension is indefinite. Um, second, it is uh, very difficult to say when one acquires knowledge of an indefinite uh, suspension. Um, I think they are making an argument first that the suspension in itself is arbitrary, and we have shown that they knew about that suspension uh, at a time when um, the timing of that knowledge deprives this tribunal of jurisdiction. Um, the suspension, whether the suspension is arbitrary or not, and this is the reason why we explained and we provided witness statement to explain what was the, the reasons for the suspension, the recommendation of the Comptoir, et cetera. And so we believe that they have to make an argument of why this suspension is arbitrary, and all they've said that it is indefinite, and we now know that it's indefinite. If that's their argument, they don't know and can't know that it's indefinite because it is not. Um, they have not said whether that suspension, if that were one year or two years or three years, would be arbitrary and therefore we cannot speculate whether they knew or didn't know that it would be one or two or three years because we don't know what time limit they set to arbitrariness in the context of that <coughs> suspension. They've simply said it's indefinite, it factually is incorrect, um, and I think we rest our case there. Thank you for, for your patience, Mr. Alexandrov. No additional questions, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm, my colleague, Mr. Alexandrov, touched on a couple of things that are in the realm of damages, so hopefully my comments will be relatively short in light of the time. Um, but I'm going to, um, as Mr. Alexandrov did, kind of touch on various issues uh, that came up in the course of the hearing, uh, as opposed to going methodically through arguments that we have already raised before. And we, of course, stand by our arguments in our pleadings. This is merely supplemental to that. Uh, there has been um, an assertion of valuations and arbitrariness with respect to valuations, and uh, one thing that claim, claimants, um, they in particular have alleged in these proceedings that various valuations of claimants' properties in the administrative and judicial phases of expropriation are arbitrary in large part because their values fluctuate between uh, and within each phase. But what has become or what became evident during the hearing, and in particular during the examination, cross-examination with Mr. Hedden, is that in fact there is nothing arbitrary about the valuation um, process in Costa Rica. First, the expropriation system in Costa Rica is designed to give the parties the, in the expropriation proceeding sufficient opportunities to identify the value of the property being taken so that the fair market value is the ultimate value reached uh, either in the administrative phase or in the judicial phase. So the what is perceived to be varying uh, values is actually the process working its way through to find a common ground at the end where the judicial, in particular judicial branch, has listened to the various arguments and evidences of the parties at various stages. And there are lots of opportunities for the, uh, the private party, the one that owns the property, to make pleadings before the judiciary and the judiciary take those factors into consideration. And indeed, I think we had talked about this earlier that in the end for these particular 
claimants uh, that are, have gone through the proceeding, the ultimate value is quite higher than the administrative value. So the process for them, in some measure, is effective. Second, even if the valuations identified in the two phases are not identical, that does not result, uh, that result is not surprising given the nature of the real estate market in Costa Rica. And this goes to the testimony of Mr. Hedden. Um, as he testified under cross-examination, it is difficult to value properties in the Guanacaste region. And you can see the quote there on the slide. Quote, would you say, Mr. Hedden, that it is difficult to value properties in the Guanacaste region? Answer, I think it is challenging, close quote. And the location on the transcript is identified in the slide. Uh, and a bit later, he said, quote, given the difficulty or challenge that you faced, do you think it's fair to say that the different people could come up with different conclusions of the valuation of the property in the area? Answer, yes. Professional valuers often come up with different opinions of value, close quote. And again, that information as far as to where that is on the transcript is on the slide. While claimants would have this tribunal believe that they came to Costa Rica to build their dream homes and live out their retirement years in tranquil Guanacaste area in Costa Rica, it be became apparent during the hearing that at least for some of the claimants, their real goal was to enter into the hot real estate market with the goal of making a quick dollar, buying and flipping, or perhaps colone, for bu uh, buying and flipping property. Um, and as Mr. Reddy, I have to correct that, it actually says Mr. Berkowitz, but it's Mr. Reddy, so apologies for that. Uh, Mr. Reddy readily admitted during cross-examination, quote, so and besides the legal side, the real estate market here was just absolutely booming, you know, skyrocketing. And so these properties were growing in value at an exponential pace. We thought we were in early, and so we thought it was still a good investment opportunity for us to buy at, for us to buy at that time, close quote. And the location and transcript is identified on the slide. This was true despite the fact that the property claimants were buying was in Las Palos National Park. This fact apparently did not bother claimants, or some of claimants, as their goal was to get in early and flip the property before the government had a chance to expropriate the, their land. In essence, claimants didn't care if the property that they were buying was in the park and subject to expropriation, so long as they were able to sell it to an unsuspecting purchaser before Costa Rica took any action against their property. And there's a slide up, and again, this is Mr. Reddy, and I apologize, it's another error. Um, but President, um, saying uh, a question, yes, was there in your mind at the time any appreciation that purchasers coming after you, those whom you may have wanted to sell the property, would not have had the same robust confidence that you had in the under interpretation of the 1991 decree and the 1995 law? Answer, you know, I don't think I tried to put myself in their mind. It was very clear to us that we were buying private property tiled in the 50 meter line, that, that we'd maintain full use and enjoyment of that private property and that park extended seaward. So I had no issue with that. Any buyer would be represented by a, a Costa Rican attorney and would get their advice and make their own decisions, close quote. And the location on the transcript is identified in the slide. And Mr. Berkowitz readily admitted the fact that their properties were in or near a park was an added advantage to their scheme. And we have the quote on the slide. Quote, for me, it was a po very positive factor that we were bordering a park and that the turtles laid their eggs, laid their nest, laid, well, laid their nest in front of our land. It was, to me, it, I had already had inquiries from one Hollywood magnet to purchase the property. This is just the type of client that we had envisioned, close quote, and the location on the transcript is in the slide. And the strategy almost worked. In fact, Mr. Berkowitz admitted in cross-examination that he was able to sell three parcels of land for around $400,000 each. Those parcels gave Mr. Berkowitz a total of about $1.25 million, and that's at the transcript uh, page 436, line 22 to 437, line, line two. This is almost the entirety of the 1.5 million that he mentioned that he had spent on all 24 B lot parcels. And I think a calculation of that percentage is around 83%. And that amount that he is getting there doesn't include other money that he may have received through the government. And as Mr. Alexandrov was mentioning with respect to sale and purchase agreements, 
uh, throughout these proceedings, and particularly with respect to damages calculations, respondent has argued that it needs to receive copies of claimant sale and purchase agreements. However, no such sale and purchase agreements have been provided to respondent. And in light of this history, it was very surprising to hear counsel for claimants argued uh, during cross-examination of Mr. Kazmarek, quote, do you know whether the sale and purchase agreement has been formally requested at this point? Close quote, and that was the transcript, uh, page 949, lines two to three. And for the record, such documentation has in fact been requested by a respondent or Mr. Kazmarek on more than one occasion. For example, Mr. Kazmarek in his first report said, quote, the preferred documentation to support the purchase prices and purchase dates would be claimant sale and purchase agreements. However, claimants have not provided any sale and purchase agreements as evidence to support their purchase prices for any of the properties at issue, close quote. That's his first report at paragraph 11. And in this proceedings, claimants themselves believe, as we now have seen through the uh, alternative damages calculation provided, but even independent of that, claimants themselves believe information in those sale and purchase agreements are important because, for example, in Mr. Reddy's testimony, he, when he first came to the sand, he corrected some dates um, and uh, purchase prices with respect to in his witness statement. And clearly he has those documents, otherwise he would not have been able to make those corrections. In fact, when respondent found a sale and purchase agreement, and Mr. Alexandrov had made mention of this a little bit earlier, with respect to Mr. Berkowitz's property and tried to introduce it into the record, claimant's counsel vehemently objected. Thus, it has been difficult to get this type of evidence on the record. And during the hearing, it has become apparent that this type of evidence is very important. Um, and in fact, the claimant's damages expert, Mr. Hedden, admitted during cross-examination that in fact, they were relevant and this is on the slide in front of you, quote, and you would agree, would you not, that sales and purchase contracts contain and can contain useful information about the specific terms of a particular sale? Answer, yes, close quote, and the transcript site is on the slide. Mr. Hedden also admitted in response to a question from the tribunal that the use of purchase prices could be an alternative basis for estimating fair market value of property, and it's up there on the slide, quote, question, I've seen proposed in connection with valuations in circumstances where comparables are not available and the property does not lend itself to an income method. The one means of estimating fair market value in those circumstances would be to identify the original purchase price and then to seek, calculate, to, seek to calculate over the duration of the entire period an average rate of return on that profit. Is that approach for which your data is or could be obtained for these properties in your professional view? Answer, yes. I believe that again, relative to these specific properties, I believe it would be very difficult. But it is done. It's done with fixed assets. It's done with other types of assets. Close quote. And the location on the transcript is on the slide. And in fact, Mr. Hedden also uh, admitted that the purchase price of Mr. Berkowitz's lots in effect with respect to the fair market value may be lower than the fair market value and therefore this is a relevant point with respect to the valuation of the property. And this is at page 840, starting in line 20. It's a further response to the question that Mr. Cantor had raised uh, in the quote that I had just listed. Quote, in the specific case, as I've talked about in my reports, trying to do that from prices that are not necessarily reflective of a market value at that time, you can try to calculate return on investment and to determine whether or not that's an appropriate return or not. But I'm not sure that would really work in the case, in this, in the case because of trying trying to trend and bend value prices, prices that were paid, unless we were able to establish that they were market prices at that time. You don't necessarily get you to the right point in a conclusion because they are not supported by the market value. And in that case, as you may recall, Mr. Hedden was as assuming for his, his market value that there was no knowledge or of park risk. So it appears that claimants now agree that purchase prices of the property at issue here can be used as basis for determining value, and that's important. But nevertheless, that information and documentation is not on the record. It has become very apparent during the hearing also that any damages claimants seek in these proceedings has been limited to claims of expropriation. And this became clear during Mr. Hedden's cross-examination. And the dialogue is up on the screen. Oh, that, no, it's not. I'm sorry, I will quote it to you. 
Uh, quote, question, in section two of your report, which you have identified in that first paragraph that you are to provide your expert opinion regarding the value of vacant lands taken from the claimants as part of the expropriation from the respondent, is that correct? Answer, yes. Question, so you were not calculating damages for a breach of fair and equitable treatment provision or for any other provision of CAFTA, is that correct? Answer, I was only focused on the market value of the parts taken from the property. Question, in the context with respect to expropriation, correct? Answer, yes, close quote. And that's a transcript page 752, lines 11 to 22, and 753, lines one to four. And indeed, today in closing comments, counsel for claimants also admitted again that the, the date that they have provided for the valuation is the date of expropriation, and that was also something Mr. Heaton had discussed in his cross-examination. Uh, one other point with respect to the market in the Guanacaste area, Mr. Hedden was resistant to uh, indicate that, in, that the market might have hit a peak somewhere around 2006, 2007 and fallen thereafter. But information uh, that Claimants Council was focusing on today with respect to the market, and in particular pointing the tribunal to the Unglabe case, which was also measuring the market at that time, the, the real estate market in the Guanacaste region at that period of the same period of time. And the parties there and also the tribunal have found that, in, that the market peaked in 2006 and fell thereafter. Under Mr. Hedden's severance damages theory, when analyzing a piece of property, one must analyze the entire parcel before the taking and then after the taking. And then you subtract the expropriated portion and compare the value of the remaining parcel before the taking with the value of the remaining parcel after the taking. The difference is the severance damages. And Mr. Hedden asserted that there was a diminution in value to the remaining non-expropriated portion of the parcel because that parcel could no longer be considered, quote, beachfront. This is in part because, according to Mr. Hedden, the land that has been expropriated which then forms part of the Las Malas, which then forms part of the Las Palas National Park, would exist between the private owner's lot and the ocean. This Mr. Hedden viewed as problematic and a fact that adversely impacted the value of the unexpropriated property. But what became clear in response to questions from the tribunal is that in fact that alleged interior property might even be more valuable than it was before the 75 meter strip of land had been expropriated. Why? This is because the more western portion of the remaining property would then be bordering parkland. And Mr. Cantor had asked a question to Mr. Hedden regarding the remaining property and, whether, and, whether, um, be, and the fact that it would be next to the park. Question, quote, would that have any positive impact on the value of the first row of the, of the eight lots, putting, putting them near the parkland, next to the parkland? Answer, yes, close quote and that's at page 849 of the transcript, lines 16 to 22. One other factor that Mr. Hedden had said could contribute to the diminution in value of the properties is the lack of beachfront access, that is, lack of accessibility to the beach from the parcel. Well, Mr. Piedra, the park administrator, mentioned in response to questions from the tribunal that the park currently has limited signage. He did not state that there were any fences or other landmark li landmarks limiting access to the national park. And that's the transcript, English transcript, line, uh, page 551, lines one through seven. Thus, the restrictions that Mr. Hedden has mentioned as adversely affecting the value of that property simply do not apply in this case. As part of his severance damages argument, Mr. Hedden also asserted that for the lots where there is only a partial taking, the value of severance damages may be greater if following expropriation of a portion of the land, the remaining portion were too small uh, for purposes of building homes on the land. Mr. Hedden asserted that no, that no such need to increase severance damages exists with respect to the SPG lots, for example, because they have a, quote, unity of title and a, quote, unity of use. But Mr. Hedden did not apply, did apply a higher amount of severance damages to the B lots on the understanding that parcels remaining after expropriation would not be large enough to develop. But in the case of B lots, there is land that is east of which is owned by and controlled by Mr. Berkowitz. 
Thus, with the SPG lots, the B, as with the SPG lots, the B lots too have unity of title and unity of use. And accordingly, there should be an adjustment made downward um, to reflect that fact. And I have that conversation on the slide in front of you. Quote, if you had the understanding that if you knew that those lots behind the B lots that are shown in the picture here belong to Mr. Berkowitz, would you feel the need to adjust your severance value to reflect it more along the lines of what you did with the SPG lots? Because in that instance, there would be a unity of title and a unity of ownership. Answer, I would have to take that under advisement, but if it met the test of unity and use, unity and title and the physical continuity, and they weren't separated and could, be, and could in fact be joined, they would get similar treatment then to the SPG lots and or you know how I describe how I ascribed a value to B to B lots five and six, where they were adjoining and could be assembled to create one one plus or minus eight thousand square foot lot, and the location on the transcript is on the slide. And today, claimant's counsel introduced another new concept, and that was the her, an admonition that the state acquire the entire property if the state is going to require only a partial portion of that. Well. Obviously, the state is not obligated to do so, um, and their request only further supports the concept that they entered into the market in a speculative time, and they were not able to capitalize on that, and now they're asking for the government to pay for that risky investment. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, if you were to decide, notwithstanding respondents' arguments to the contrary, that you have jurisdiction to hear this case, and that respondent is, has somehow breached its obligations under CAFTA, then you would need to decide what type of damage or what damages amount would be appropriate to award claimants. It seems to us you have two choices from the outset. The key issue is to decide whether a risk of expropriation existed at the time claimants purchased their property or not. If you believe that there were a risk at the time claimants purchased their property, then you must go with Mr. Kazmarek's valuation. If, on the other hand, you believe that there was no risk of expropriation at the time of purchase, then you must go with Mr. Hedden's valuation. But if you were to go with Mr. Hedden's valuation, you would need to consider his valuation in light of all the circumstances and criticisms that Mr. Kazmarek has identified in his two reports, including that claimants failed to provide the sale and purchase agreements for the affected lots, the fact that the FTI's appraisals were inconsistent with the market trends, the fact that claimants' severance damages claims are calculated as difficult to understand and appears may, may well be overvalued, and indeed, the failure to f provide a complete transparency with respect to his calculations, as you will recall uh, in the cross-examination or in the presentation of Mr. Hedden's slides, he included information about assumptions that he was making he had not yet revealed to the parties and to the tribunal. It may also be useful at this point to consider what to do if you were to award damages to claimants. We, of course, do not believe that the tribunal ever needs to reach this point. But in case you do, we believe the following steps are, um, would be need to be taken. First, the tribunal will need to determine the fair market value for each of the 24 lots at issue in this proceeding, to the extent that you were to find that they, they each need to be valued and awarded damages. Second, the tribunal will need to determine the amount of each party that each party in the expropriation proceeding has already received, so you can reduce that amount from the payments that have already, that the, for the damages that are being requested. Third, the property owners would need to transfer title to the state. And finally, all domestic expropriation proceedings with respect to these properties at issue would need to be discontinued in some way or another. And also with respect to colonies, they're, they're requesting colonies and the payment in colonies, and therefore it would need to make that calculation as to the amount of colonies that would be due. So there are a number of steps that would need to happen. And with respect to interest, during cross-examination of respondents' damages expert, Mr. Kazmarek, uh, claimant's counsel asked Mr. Kazmarek why he had calculated a simple rate of interest, when in other cases in which he had been an expert, he had indicated that compound interest was applicable. Well, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, this is a rather surprising question coming from claimant's counsel, as it's in their memorial that they apply the legal standard, the legal interest rate published by the Costa Rican Central Bank in accordance with Article 1163 of the Civil Code of Costa Rica. That's at claimant's memorial on the merits at paragraph 328. According to Mr. Kazmarek, 
who referred to an official Costa Rican government website that provides a proper calculation of interest under Article 1163 of the Civil Code, that website calculates a simple, not compound interest, as claimants advocate. Thus, having selected this source for the purpose of calculating interest to be added to claimants' damages calculation, claimants cannot now seek a greater amount because they believe that they will receive more in interest by compounding the interest semi-annually. And that is all that I have with respect to damages. I think Mr. Alexandrov has some uh, concluding remarks. Thank you, Ms. Alexandrov. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, just um, two points that I would add to Ms. Halleck McCandle's presentation on, on damages. Um, Article 10.7, paragraph 2C, requires, as I think Mr. Cantor pointed out, um, or if, if I misremember, I apologize, but the, it requires that the compensation uh, shall not reflect any change in value occurring before the intended expropriation had become known earlier. And <clears throat> obviously, if there is an expropriation, this provision uh, has to be complied with. In compliance with that provision, we assume, um, claimants have instructed Mr. Hedden, their damages expert, um, to value all property as of May 27, 2008. Um, he admitted that it was on this date that the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court issued its decision, holding that the 125 meters run inland rather than seaward. Um, and therefore, this is the assumption made by claimants as to when the expropriation took place, and obviously we've discussed the significance of that date for jurisdictional purposes. Um, and this question was, I think the President probed uh, with Mr. Hedden this matter, and I'm not going to elaborate any further other than to say this shows also the understanding that claimants had of what was the date of the expropriation and all the consequences in relation to um, to jurisdiction that um, that flow from that. Um, the, um, I think the other relevant point for damages is that, as Mr. Hedden admitted and Ms. Howard McCandle stated, he calculated damages and therefore claimants calculated damages only in the event of an expropriation. So you are not equipped um, to consider damages um, if you come, which we consider would be a very long way, um, to a conclusion that other provisions of CAFTA have been breached. Um, and in the context of expropriation, there was an exchange, I think, within, between Mr. Cantor and counsel for claimant on the, could it be, I'm summarizing and I apologize, it may be a little bit liberal because I don't have the, the transcript in front of me, but the question was, is it possible that the date of valuation be after the expropriation? Um, let's say at the time of the award. Um, and I think our answer to that is, it may be possible in some cases of expropriation um, where the tribunal finds that the expropriation doesn't meet, uh, doesn't meet other conditions in addition to the non-payment of prompt, adequate, and effective compensation, such as, for example, public purpose, um, non-discriminatory, et cetera. And that one case that comes to mind is ADC versus Hungary, um, where the tribunal found that the expropriation was um, arbitrary and otherwise unlawful in addition to the fact that compensation had not been paid and decided that because of historic reasons the value of the property in that case and airport terminal had increased between the time of the expropriation and the, the, um, the time of the award to pay, um, to value the, the concession at the time of the award. Obviously this is not the case here. Again, as I um, discussed, there is no question that whatever measures Costa Rica took were for a public purpose. Uh, and therefore, any variation of the date uh, as of which the value of the property should be valued should not be permissible. Um, there is no such a concept in relation to other breaches. So to the extent that we're talking about breaches of other provisions of the treaty, the date of the breach is the date as of which the, the property should be valued. Um, and let me now conclude by saying, on behalf of Costa Rica, we ask that you dismiss all claims for lack of jurisdiction. 
on the grounds of uh, lack of temporal jurisdiction that we have discussed. In the alternative, if you reach issues of liability, we ask that you conclude that Costa Rica has not breached any provision of CAFTA. Um, if you come that far and conclude that there is a breach, we ask that you don't award damages because no proper damages have been calculated. And the reason is very simple. Um, Mr. Hedden and General Claimants are calculating damages on the basis of the fact that the property was not within a park and therefore um, the value of that property should not be discounted by what has been called here a risk factor, uh, in other words, the possibility that it might be one day expropriated. The facts, as we've shown you, are very different. And if you conclude that claimants did have knowledge and therefore the purchase of the property did include a risk factor, that the property one day might be expropriated, and that obviously had an effect on the value of the property at the time it was purchased. Mr. Hedden has not performed those calculations for you, and you cannot rely on his um, damages reports unless you conclude, which in our view is extremely unlikely, that claimants had no knowledge and their purchase did not reflect the fact that the property was within the park and was therefore at a minimum at risk of being expropriated or otherwise its use and enjoyment were restricted. And finally, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, uh, we do ask for costs and fees. Um, Article 42.1 of the UNCTRAL rules provide that the cost of the arbitration shall in principle be borne by the unsuccessful party or parties and so if you rule in favor of Costa Rica, we respectfully request costs and attorney's fees. Council for claimants um, focused on the sentence that follows, which says that the tribunal may um, do differently, taking into account the circumstances of the case. Our argument is that if you take into account the circumstances of the case, um, you should, you will have a stronger basis to award Costa Rica costs and fees. We don't have to prove that the claims were frivolous. Um, but, and I'm not going to go again through all the factors that you need to take into consideration, but the outlandish conspiracy theories, which, which were on dozens of pages of, of the memorial, the, the accusations, the arguments that Costa Rica did not act in the public interest, um, the ever-changing and shifting case and arguments from the memorial on the merits to the rejoinder and at the hearing, um, the um, intentional, we believe, decision to withhold documents that would have proven the purchase price, which at the end of the day was admitted as relevant. Uh, all these are factors that you should consider um, and should um, lead you to stay with the first sentence of Article 4221 of the UNCTRA rule, rule should you decide in favor of Costa Rica. And on that, we end our closing. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Please make your point and comments. Um, that brings the closing submissions of both parties to an end. I'm going to uh, ask for the indulgence of, of everyone. Um, I don't think it's going to be necessary for the tribunal to, uh, as it were, rise for half an hour to consider the, the, the closing formality issues. But uh, we'll just go uh, off the microphone, off the record, just for, for a few minutes just to, uh, just to confer.
Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can go uh, back on the, on the record. I see the test, test, test. So are the interpreters hearing, are the court reporters hearing? Yes? So there are a number of, of closing formalities that we, uh, that we have to, to deal with. Uh, and to start off, first of all, let me just draw your attention, remind you what Article 20, not Article, Paragraph 25, Paragraph 1 of Procedural Order Number 1 says. Uh, the tribunal notes that the parties do not at this stage see the need for post-hearing submissions. At the conclusion of any hearing, the tribunal shall decide whether the parties may or are requested to file post-hearing memorials, as well as when and in what form the parties shall file evidence regarding the quantification of costs. The tribunal shall thereafter, at an appropriate point, declare the hearings closed. Now, we've had uh, an opportunity to uh, reflect on, on the issues both during the course of this week and, and, and today uh, and uh, have concluded the following. Uh, first of all, the tribunal has concluded that in fact we would like to present the parties with an opportunity to uh, file post-hearing submissions but on very narrow points. We've concluded that we would like to have post-hearing submissions uh, amounting to observations on the issues of law and interpretation that were addressed in the submissions of the non-disputing parties. That's it. Issues of law and interpretation addressed in the submissions of the non-disputing parties. And we've got some constraints relating to those uh, post-hearing submissions. Uh, first of all, we would like those to be not more than 30 pages. We are not going to, to, to prescribe the, the point form or the size of the margins, but we certainly don't expect that they come with a magnifying glass. So we expect you know, some, something around a normal submission, but if you want to do that in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, a, a single space or double space, that's a matter for you, but not more than 30 pages. We would like those on or before Monday the 18th of May, uh, close of business uh, EST Monday the 18th of May, and to be communicated by each party separately to the tribunal secretary, and the tribunal secretary would, will then um, uh, send uh, each submission on to uh, the other party and to the tribunal. So this is not an invitation for you to address uh, issues of a fact relating to the proceedings, really simply to engage with the issues of law and interpretation that were set out in the, uh, in the submissions of the non-disputing parties. The second issue goes to uh, quantification of costs. Um, and in the first instance, we would uh, like um, the parties to seek to reach an agreement on the template of a cost schedule that you would be content with. In other words, the headings under which the cost should be submitted. Um, if you can reach agreement on that, uh, that's without the figures, that will be helpful. Uh, we don't want to prescribe to you at this stage, you know, whether it should be, um, you know, partners, uh, associates, assistants. Uh, it may simply be councils, experts, uh, other costs, but we would like in the first instance for the two parties to put their heads together to seek to reach agreement on that template. Uh, once again, on or before uh, uh, Monday 18th of May. If uh, you can both reach agreement on that template, we will thereafter invite you to quantify your costs under that template. If you cannot reach agreement on that template, we will then prescribe a template. So it's really an invitation to you uh, to, uh, to proceed um, uh, in agreement. Uh, sec uh, third issue, um, we would like, the tribunal would like to be informed of any factual development in relation to the issues engaged in these proceedings uh, without any annotation or argumentation. For example, if there is a new decree uh, or new declaration of public interest, the publication of the study on the Contralia report or anything of that nature, we would like to be informed of that through uh, the tribunal secretary, as I say, without any annotation or argumentation. If the tribunal considers that it's necessary to be further informed, we will give both parties an opportunity uh, to comment. Apart from these issues, in other words, the post-hearing submissions, the quantification of costs and these factual updates, we do not um, expect any further submissions uh, from the parties 
save to the extent that any party wishes to make an application uh, to the tribunal to do so on notice to the other party or that the tribunal explicitly requests uh, any further submissions. But beyond that, we don't expect any further submissions. Uh, one further point to draw to your attention uh, by way of, as it were, sort of transparency of the tribunal's uh, uh, thinking, and uh, let me again enjoin you not to try and read the tea leaves as to where we're going because we don't yet know where we're going. We have various issues to consider going to uh, jurisdiction and to liability, and we have not formulated our view. We have, however, preliminarily, and I emphasize preliminarily, concluded that if we are with the claimant on jurisdiction and on any issue of liability, we are likely to require additional evidence and perhaps submissions on the issue of damages because that may very well be contingent on any findings of fact that we uh, come up with. So this is simply to put you on notice that we don't at the moment feel uh, that we are in a position to address comprehensively the issue of, of, of damages. Um, that may change, so it's simply putting down a marker so that nothing takes you by surprise in due course. Now, I note uh, that um, uh, paragraph 25.1 of the procedural order says the tribunal shall thereafter at an appropriate point declare, declare the hearings closed and that article 31 paragraph 2 of the answer trial rule says the arbitral tribunal may if it considered it, considered it necessary owing to exceptional circumstances decide on its own initiative or upon application of, e, of, of a party to reopen the hearings at any time before the award is made. Now notwithstanding article 31 paragraph 2 I'm not declaring the hearing closed at this stage. We've got further submissions to come uh, from you that we will address in due course. I think the only other um, uh, point uh, uh, to come from me is really uh, a, 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 a point of thanks, which I will give in just a moment. But before I do so, let me just give an opportunity to, uh, to both parties to uh, raise any issue in the light of what I've just said that they would like to raise. Um, one point which is I hope small but uh, most of the members of the claimants team are starting other hearings on Monday. Uh, Ms. Cicchetti gets to fly back to her four-year-old tomorrow and starts a two-week hearing here on Monday morning. Uh, a privilege no doubt. Uh, I have to go to other things and I'm just wondering and I'm not seeking a much longer time whether we could have until the 25th of May. Uh, for the submission on the non-party, non-disputing parties in order to try to uh, uh, induce you to accept that. I don't think there's a, we're not going to come anywhere close to the time, the space limit you provided, but it would be helpful. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Alexandrov has any views on that, but it'll be necessary for me to recruit other people to do the work that otherwise would be done um, by the existing members of the team if we don't get that extra time. Mr. Alexandrov, do you have, have any difficulty with that? Mr. President, may I respond to that question and address other points? Sure. Um, the, the short answer is we have absolutely no difficulty with that, um, and we are happy to accept the date of 25 May, I think it was. Yes. yes. Um, but I want to comment a little bit on what we are doing by that date. Um, so with respect to your first point, the 30-page submission on law and interpretation issues in the non-disputing party submissions. Are the parties free to agree on a lower page limit? The, the submissions were fairly short, and 30 pages seems to us a lot, and if we reach an agreement, would the tribunal allow us the flexibility to agree on a lower page limit? Mr. Alexandrov, I can say that if the parties agree, the tribunal is very likely to be minded to agree. Uh, uh, the 30-page page limit is not a, an, an injunction or a request to cover 30 pages in close type. It's simply giving you an opportunity. If you wanted to do it in one page, or frankly not to submit anything at all because you didn't think there was anything to be said, you'd be free to do that. But if you can agree on a, on a lower page limit, you'd be very welcome to agree. I, I appreciate that, Mr. President. We, uh, the reason I'm raising the question is we understand that we don't have to fill in 30 pages. but. In the absence of an agreement between the parties, one party submits five pages and the other one 30 pages, that may seem to be unfair. So if the tribunal allows us that flexibility, 
we may seek to reach a different agreement. If we don't, we'll stick with the 30 pages. Uh, well, Mr. Alexandrov, I'd, I'd invite you uh, to do so. Let me just illuminate uh, perhaps a little bit more why we have requested these post-hearing submissions. It's not simply because we felt that uh, from the, the Friday night when the two non-disputing parties put in their written submissions or on the Tuesday morning when uh, El Salvador made its oral statement that you didn't have an adequate time to respond. It's because we feel we would like to hear the parties more explicitly on the issues addressed in the non-disputing parties' post-hearing submissions. So this is not an invitation uh, to you to, as it were, crystallize your thinking. It's an invitation to you to inform us better than we think we've so far been informed about those issues. Um, thank you. Um, with respect to the cost submission template, um, I assume the date is also moving to 25 May, which is fine with us. Yes, indeed. Um, I also assume that this date uh, relates to an agreement on the template rather than the actual submissions. Yes, indeed. That would be the agreement on the template, and then thereafter we would invite you to fill in that template if you can reach agreement. If not, we'll prescribe the template and invite you to do so. And just to confirm, the cost submissions would not include arguments as to why costs should be paid to one or the other party, but simply a statement of what costs and fees were incurred. So, I'm sorry, I'm leaving you cold. I, I uh, was thinking I was understanding the conversation until that moment. I thought that the request was for a template and not a filled-in template, but maybe I misunderstood. By the 25th, if that's going to be the date, uh, it will be for a template and we will then invite you to fill in that, uh, that template. I think we've had submissions from both parties on, on the costs that you are both seeking. So this is a quantification of costs exercise rather than an argument of costs exercise. Mr. President, I apologize for the misunderstanding. I was asking about the actual submission that will come later and I wanted to make sure, which is our desire, that we don't present argument as to why costs should be paid but simply a statement of what the costs are. And the reason I'm asking that question now is obviously that will reflect on the template. Yes, indeed. Um, and then perhaps our final point is if the tribunal will require, or you mentioned the tribunal may require additional submissions in whatever form on um, updates and perhaps other matters such as costs, um, we will then ask that any cost submissions be made as a last step when we know what costs have been incurred through those additional steps that the tribunal may require us to perform. Well, uh, Mr. Alexander, we'll, we'll take that um, as it were, under advisement, under consideration, and when the tribunal comes back to both parties and asks you to fill in that uh, cost schedule, we'll indicate. Um, it may be whatever the outcome in due course that it's going to be useful to have a quantification of costs up until the 25th of, of May uh, to crystallize uh, those, those, those costs. Mr. President, then I'm now uh, a little bit lost. I understood that by the 25th of May we, we are agreeing and providing to the tribunal an agreement on the template, not the actual cost submission. And I was asking about the actual submissions that will be made in compliance with that template and whether they can be made after the other steps are taken so that we can reflect the costs associated with those steps. Well, let me try and capture it as I think the tribunal has it in it, its collective mind. By the 25th of May, we would expect to have the, the post-hearing submissions as we've described them. We would also expect and hope that we will have an agreement on a cost schedule. Um, thereafter, the tribunal will come back to the parties and invite the parties to complete that cost schedule. The completion of that cost schedule will relate to the quantification of costs up until the point at which the cost schedule is due to be completed. Sorry, Mr. President, I don't want to extend, but on a, on a related matter, I thought we should, while well, we're all happily gathered together, and of course, fresh as daisies, uh, just address the question of the update. And I have a, a procedural suggestion to avoid any controversy is that in the event that either party 
weeks to uh, seeks to advance and update and in that invitation that the other party have advanced notice and an opportunity to comment um, t with between parties only so that so that nothing immediately be sent to the tribunal that is a procedural suggestion which I think is particular in the context of the present case a helpful one um, I also wanted to observe that uh, it does refer back of course to um, the application that the uh, claimants had made to update the record of, of the proceedings with respect to some of the lots. And I, th I think where we are at present is that uh, the, in the course of the respondent's cross-examination, the substance of those documents were all solicited or uh, from, I believe, Ms. Chavez or otherwise. And so uh, I'll just leave this request on the record. I think those are updated documents which ought to be received by the tribunal, and I invite my friend to, to um, agree with that. But otherwise, those are, those are updates which we have, actually, presently in hand. Otherwise, I think uh, I'd suggest the general procedure be adopted going forward. Unless Mr. Alexandro, uh, well, let me invite Mr. Alexandro to respond to your <coughs> suggestion as regards the seven documents, if I recall correctly. Mr. President, when you um, communicated to us the tribunal's desire allow updates if such updates are necessary, you said without annotations um, and without argument. We understand the point without argument. Um, perhaps you could clarify what you mean when you say without annotation. Do you mean that you want a narrative of an update without documents or you want documents without narrative which may or may not contain arguments? We're not sure uh, what the form or the format would be of such updates? Well, in, in the first instance, uh, let me make it clear that what we are not seeking at this stage is any updated information relating to valuation, because of course we've indicated that, if at, if at all, we're going to need that later. Um, Mr. Cope, I don't have directly in mind the detail of your seven documents, uh, but my recollection is that you wanted to submit them because they were relevant to valuation, and indeed, um, Mr. Alexandra, for your uh, application in respect of the, the one document that was refused, the way that you put it was uh, that this was directly relevant to valuation. So we don't, uh, uh, are not soliciting those types of documents. I think what we are trying to avoid, and um, Mr. Cope, I take absolutely your suggestion that it, this would be usefully first handled by uh, an exchange between the parties themselves rather than uh, to the tribunal directly. What we would like to uh, avoid or ensure uh, is that the tribunal is informed of any development in relation to these lots, which may have a bearing on any decision that we make. Uh, for example, we are aware that there are a number of lots that have not so far been subject to a, to a declaration of public interest. Uh, it may be, and I'm not doing anything other than speculating, but it may be that the tribunal considers that the fact of a declaration of public interest is important. What we don't want to do is that we are putting a signature on the bottom of a page of an award only to find out that the day before there was some material development. So this is not an invitation to you, to either party, to continue your submissions in respect of any document, but rather to draw to the tribunal's attention material developments of fact. Um, and uh, I'm quite content to leave it to the two parties to have uh, an inter-parties discussion as to whether uh, it's a matter that ought to be drawn to the tribunal's attention. Uh, if you have a dispute, no doubt you will come to that, uh, come to us about that. Um, but I think that's, that's the most that we can say at, at the moment. Mr. Alexander. Mr. President, thank you for that clarification. And we accept the offer to confer with the other parties should such a situation arise. And obviously, if there is a dispute about what should be provided to the tribunal and how and when you will hear about about it um, in relation to the documents that claimant sought to introduce into the record uh, the end of la at the end of last week uh, they withdrew that request and um, any request to introduce those documents because they are le relevant as updates therefore should follow the procedure that we just discussed. In other words, we should be approached and there should be a discussion about whether those are updates, what are they updating, and so on and so forth. So 
um, those documents that were withdrawn. If they want to reintroduce them, then we propose to follow the procedure that we just agreed to. Yes, indeed, and again, to, to try and clarify a little bit further if this is necessary. I mean, we've been told throughout this hearing that there are documents that, for example, are published on the on various websites of the Costa Rican government or elsewhere. Uh, that's the kind of information that we would like to ensure is brought to our attention. Um, so we are not inviting the parties to continue a process of drip feeding submissions to us through documents. Uh, it's really factual submissions, or factual, factual uh, d developments uh, that we, we may wish to take account of. Understood. Thank you very much. Anything else, Mr. Coco? No, Mr. President. Thank you for your patience and, and uh, thank you for the week. Well, I think it's really my um, uh, uh, happy duty to, uh, to, to give the thanks. And I'm going to start uh, giving the thanks briefly with the most important people, the interpreters and the court reporters. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's uh, often challenging to have a, a hearing in, in more than one uh, language, and we appreciate very much the indulgence and assistance of the, of the interpreters uh, and, the, and the court reporters. And we've noticed some uh, lovely typographicals uh, in the uh, in the in the in the in the live note as it's been uh, as it's been developing, and it's a pity we can't capture those uh, lovely typographicals. But thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank the the, the non-disputing parties uh, for their uh, for their their written submissions in the case of El Salvador for its oral submission as well, and for your attendance at the back of the uh, at the back of the room. Your your participation is very much appreciated, um, and I'd like to. Uh, both thank and commend uh, the, uh, the parties, council and experts for your uh, extremely uh, courteous, thorough, thoughtful, um, uh, well-addressed uh, submissions which have helped us um, immeasurably. Um, as a footnote, I don't for the life of me see how we could have done this in less than five days, but that's another matter entirely. Um, and I'd also like to, 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 uh, to, to close um, I take it, you can take it for granted that uh, this comes from, uh, from the tribunal and the tribunal secretary, all of these thanks uh, as well. But I'd just like to close with, um, with, a, with an, a, a, a note or an acknowledgement both to claimants personally and to uh, the representatives of, of, of the government, government officials. Um, I think amongst the lawyers, and I include the tribunal members and counsel, we appreciate very much uh, how difficult it can be to see the issues with which you are dealing with at a personal level come before an international tribunal in these circumstances in a, in a public, uh, public fashion. So we very much appreciate your assistance and your indulgence um, with us this week in assisting us uh, reaching what we hope will be a, a, a considered uh, a judgment in due course. So thank you very much. Um, as I said, I'm not declaring the hearings closed. I'm simply adjourning the hearings and declaring this phase of the proceedings closed. And safe travels to everyone. Thank you very much indeed.